Hello everyone, welcome to the Andy's Public Library Storytime. I'm Miss Pam and today is Wednesday, August 26th. So many of you are getting ready to go back to school on whatever level that is. Some of you are going to be doing school from home again. Some of you are going to be going to school part time. And every school is a little bit different and there's going to be a whole lot of new rules going on. And so a couple of today's books are about children having to deal with rules. And one of them is about a boy who absolutely loves the library. And I just want to say, no matter what type of school you're going to be going to this fall, just remember that your local librarians are here to help you and help your parents in any way that we can. So, if anything, to help you get really good books to read at home. But thank you for joining us today. So, our first book is going to be Abidaro and the Mischievous Dream by Julius Lester and Jerry Pickney. So, let's see what this book is about. Look at that. Uh oh. Does this look familiar? <laughs> One day children got tired of having to do what their parents told them. Time to get up, parents said when children were sound asleep. Time to go to bed, parents said when children were wide awake. Don't eat so much, parents said when children were eating something they liked. Eat some more, parents said when it was something children didn't like. Parents did not make sense and children were tired of it. But what could they do? Better than anything and anybody in the world, teddy bears know how children feel. So one night when the children were sleeping asleep as sweet as flower juice, their teddy bears gave children a dream as happy as a butterfly's heart. The children started laughing in their sleep as the dream told them what to do when they woke up the next morning. But then something strange happened. Even the teddy bears were surprised and everybody knows how hard it is to surprise a teddy bear. The dream said, I'm so wonderful, I think I'll also give myself to the children who don't have teddy bears. Yes, I'll give myself to all the children in all the world. What's going on there? Oh no, don't do that, the teddy bears said to the dream in voices as small as bees' eyes, but it was too late. Quieter than darkness and faster than fear, the dream was already going from child to child, telling them that when they awoke, they could do whatever they wanted, when they wanted, and they would never be punished. Hmm. Now high in the mountains of Africa lived Abidaro, the guardian of children. From the beginning of time, he had watched children while they slept to be sure no harm came to them. He could also hear the thoughts of teddy bears and see the dreams of children. So he chuckled while he watched this dream weave its into each child heart. What fun his children would have if they didn't have to do what adults told them to. It would only be for a day or so. What harm could come from that? Then he had an idea. His sister, Olara, was the guardian of animals and didn't care about anything or anyone except her animals. She never paid attention when he wanted her to look at his children taking their first steps or to see how proud they were on their first day of school. Suppose he told the dream to weave itself around the hearts of all the animals. Just as Abadaro can hear the thoughts of teddy bears, they hear his. And they shouted, oh no, don't do that. But Abidaro had already spread his cloak and flown quickly over the earth, chasing the dream as it went from child to child with the speed of happiness. He caught it only as it was leaving the sleep of the last child, a little girl in a remote valley in Tibet. Well done, friend dream, Abidaro addressed it. Now go and speak to the heart of every animal, horned and beaked, clawed and pawed, big and small, tame and wild. The dream was excited to be of service to Abidaro. And off it went. Uh oh. Morning came. Time to get up, mothers and fathers all over the world called to their children. Yet, answered the children in Russia. Lo, answered the children in Israel. None, answered the children in France. Nine, answered the children in Germany. No, answered the children in Italy, South America, and Canada. 
Uh huh, answered the children in the United States. In every country, on every continent, in every language that slipped off the tongue, the children would not get out of bed. What's the matter, fathers and mothers wanted to know. From now on, we're going to do what we want to do, the children answered, and we do not want to go to school every day, and you can't make us. The parents were furious. They were so furious that their anger would have swallowed the children if something hadn't scared it. What happened so frightened the children, they forgot about doing what they wanted and ran to their parents, but the teddy bears were not surprised. We knew this was going to happen, they said in voices as soft as dragonfly tears. Uh-oh. What happened was that all the pets and all the animals and all the bedrooms and all the pet shops in all the world took off their leashes, unlocked their cages, and pushed the cover off their tanks. Canaries, minor birds, parrots, monkeys, gerbils, dogs, rabbits, snakes, spiders, turtles, and fish crawled, ran, flew, slithered, and crept outside. Out of the jungles, forests, and mountains came lions, tigers, elephants, gorillas, chimps, water buffalo, hippopotamuses, rhinoceroses and giraffes. They went to the airports, got on jet planes, and flew to Paris, New York, Shanghai, Cairo, Lima, Nairobi, and all the cities in all the world. What's going on now? The elephant is out of its element, a mother in Stockholm said as one uh, of the one lying in her son's bed. There's a tiger drinking cider with my daughter, said a father in Fargo. That llama is wearing my pajamas, exclaimed a father in Tokyo. That bear has a comb in his hair, shouted a grandmother in Manila. Snakes were curled on couches watching videos and eating popcorn, while dogs played baseball, buzzards rode bicycles, buffaloes jumped rope, penguins surfed the internet, and the whales played soccer. But the animals had the most fun dressing up in the parents' best clothes and going out to fancy restaurants. This book is getting sillier by the minute. <laughs> Back on a mountaintop in Africa, a woman as beautifully black as a panther on a night when there was no moon watched her animals and could not understand why they were acting like, like people. Why would they suddenly want to be so silly? Abadaro, Alara called to her brother. What is going on? Help me, please. My goodness, Alvadaro exclaimed, pretending to be surprised. Your animals look so foolish. Did you do something to them? Don't be ridiculous, Alara shot back. And you'd better wipe that smirk off your face. It doesn't seem to me that your children are very happy. She was right. The children did not like having to share their homes with the animals. Turn the water off, a child total giraffe when it came out of the shower. The giraffe looked at the child and wandered away, dripping wet all over the house. Come help me put the dishes in the dishwasher, another child said to an, a rhinoceros horses. The rhinoceros horse sat on the dishwasher and squashed it, breaking all the dishes and pots and silverware inside. The children went to their parents. Mom, Dad, please make the things, things like that they were before. We wish we could, the mothers and fathers said, but the animals won't listen to us either. The children went and sat in corners and began to cry. High on the mountain in Africa, Albadaro started to cry too. This was not what he had thought would happen. He should have learned by now that teddy bears are always right. Albadaro knew he had to tell Alara that it was his fault, that he had been playing a joke on her. I'm sorry, he concluded. Can you make the animals become animals again so my children will stop crying? Alara was angry with her brother, but before she could say anything out of the corner of her eye, she saw some animals on skateboards and rollerblades and some monkeys playing golf. Alara swooped down. What do you think you're doing? She asked the monkeys. Her voice, voice trembled with rage. Trying to make this par three, if you'll be quiet, one monkey replied. That's it, Alara exclaimed. Let's see how you really like being different. Alara flew high into the navel of the sky and clapped her hands three times. Suddenly, giraffes had short legs, lions were bald, and when they went to roar, only a squeak came out. Dogs meowed, cats barked, and elephants became the size of bugs. Tigers were pink with green stripes, and monkeys were as yellow as bananas. Whales had wheels, and birds swam. This book is getting crazy.
<laughs> Look at that pink tiger. The animals looked at each other and remembered how noble and beautiful they had once been. They raised their faces and looked up at Alara, hovering high in the heavens above them. We're sorry, the dogs meowed. We're sorry, the cats barked. We're sorry, the lions and tigers squeaked. Satisfied with their apologies, Alara clapped her hands again, and the animals went back to their cages and tanks, back to the jungles and mountains where they were supposed to be, looking like they were supposed to look and sounding like they were supposed to sound. Then Albadaro put all the people into a deep sleep. When they awoke the next morning, no one remembered what had happened. No one, that is, except for the teddy bears. Alara told them that they, if, if they ever told anyone what had happened, she would turn them into Brussels sprouts, and no child would cuddle with a Brussels sprout. Well, teddy bears like to cuddle more than anybody in the world, so they promised not to say a word ever. And that's why, to this day, teddy bears look like they have a secret. Well, now, the children wanted to do whatever they wanted, but when they saw the animals acting crazy and doing whatever they wanted, suddenly they became a little bossy, didn't they? But that was kind of a crazy story. Okay, our next story is by the great Toni Morrison with Slade Morrison. The Big Box, illustrated by Giselle Potter. Patty and Mickey and Liza Sue live in a big brown box. It has carpets and curtains and beanbag chairs and the door has three big locks. Oh, it's pretty inside and the windows are wide with shutters to keep out the day. They have swings and slides and custom made beds and the doors open only one way. Their parents visit on Wednesday nights and you should see the stuff they get. Pizza and Legos and bubble yum and a four color TV set. On Christmas Day, they got a picture of the sky and a butterfly under a glass. An aquarium thing with a plastic fish made so it would last. Oh, the seagulls scream and rabbits hop and beavers chew trees when they need them. But Patty and Mickey and Liza Sue, those kids can't handle their freedom. Now, Patty used to live with a two-way door in a little white house quite near us. But she had too much fun in school all day and made the grown-ups nervous. She talked in the library and sang in class, went four times to the toilet. She ran through the halls and wouldn't play with dolls, and when we pledged the flag, she'd spoil it. So the teachers who loved her had a meeting one day to try to find a cure. They thought and talked and thought some more, till finally they were sure. Oh, Patty, they said, you're an awfully sweet girl with a lot of potential inside you. But you have to know how far to go so the grown-up world can abide you. Now the rules are listed on the walls, so there's no need to repeat them. We all agree, your parents and we, that you just can't handle your freedom. Even sparrows scream. Patty sat still and, to avoid their eyes, she lowered her little girl head. But she heard their words and she felt their eyes and this is what she said. I fold my stocks, socks and I eat my beets. And on Saturday mornings I change my sheets. I lace my shoes and wash my neck and under my nails there's not a speck. Even sparrows scream and rabbits hop and beavers chew trees when they need them. I don't mean to be rude, I want to be nice, but I'd like to hang on to my freedom. I know you're smart and I know what you think you're doing what is best for me. But if freedom is handled just your way, then it's not my freedom or free. So they gave little Patty an understanding hug and put her in a big brown box. It has carpets and curtains and beanbag chairs, but the door has three big locks. Oh, it's pretty inside and the windows are wide with shutters to keep out the day. She has swings and slides and a canopy bed, but the door only opens one way. Her parents visit on Wednesday nights and you should see the stuff she gets. Barbie and Pepsi and Princess Phone and a hi-fi stereo set. On Easter, she got a brand new jeans with Nikes and a Spice Girl shirt, marzipan eggs and jelly beans in a jar of genuine dirt. Old parrots scream and rabbits hop and beavers chew trees when they need them, but Patty and Mickey and Liza Sue, those kids can't handle their freedom. Now Mickey used to live on the 18th floor with two elevators to serve us, 
but he had too much fun in the streets all day and made the grown-ups nervous. He wrote his name on the mailbox lid and sat on the su supper's Honda. He hollered in the hall and played handball right where the sign said not to. So the tenants who loved him had a meeting one day to try to find a cure. They thought and talked and thought some more till finally they were sure. Oh, Mickey, they said, you're an awfully nice kid with wonderful future before you, but you have to know how far you can go so the grown-up world can adore you. Now the rules are listed on the elevator door, so there's no need to repeat them. We all agree, your parents and we, that you just can't handle your freedom. If owls can scream. Mickey sat still and avoided their eyes by lowering his little boy head, but he heard their words and he felt their eyes, and this is what he said. But I comb my hair and I don't do drugs and every day I vacuum the rugs. I feed the hamster and water the plants and once a week I hang up my pants. If owls can scream and rabbits hop and beavers chew trees when they need them, why can't I be a kid like me who doesn't have to handle his freedom? I know you're smart and I know that you think you're doing what's best for me, but if freedom is handled just your way, then it's not my freedom or free. So they gave little Mickey a knowing smile and put him in the big brown box. It has carpets and curtains and beanbag chairs, but the door has three big locks. Oh, it's pretty inside and the windows are wide with shutters to keep out the day. He has swings and slides in a double bunk bed, but the door only opens one way. His parents visit on Wednesday nights just after their comedy show with blimpies and frisbees and comic books and matchbook cars that go. For his birthday, he got a store-bought cake and an autographed basketball and a record that played exactly the sound made by a living seagull. Oh, baby seals scream and rabbits hop and beavers chew trees when they need them, but Patty and Mickey and Liza sue poor kids can't handle their freedom. Now Liza lived in a little farmhouse where only the crickets disturbed us. But she had too much fun in the fields all day and made the grown-ups nervous. She let the chickens keep their eggs, let the squirrels into the fruit trees. She took the bit from the horse's mouth and fed the honey to the honeybees. So the neighbors who loved her had a meeting one day to try to find a cure. They thought and talked and thought some more till finally they were sure. Oh, Liza, they said, you're a wonderful child and we really don't want to remove you. But you have to know how far to go if you want grown-ups to approve you. Now the rules are clear in everybody's mind, so there's no need to repeat them. We all agree, your parents and we, that you simply can't handle your freedom. Will the crows not scream? Liza sat still and avoided their eyes by lowering her little girl head. But she heard their words and she felt their eyes, and this is what she said. But I've worn my braces for three years now and gave up peanut brittle, and I do my fractions and bottle feed the lambs that are too little. Will the crows not scream and the rabbits hop? Won't the beavers chew trees when they need them? If you shut me up and put me away because I can't handle my freedom? I know you're smart and I know you think you're doing what's best for me, but if freedom is handled just your way, then it's not my freedom or free. So they gave little Liza a pat on the cheek and put her in the big brown box. It has carpets and curtains and beanbag chairs, but the door has three big locks. Oh, it's pretty inside and the windows are wide with shutters to keep out the day. She has swings and slides in a waterbed, but the door only opens one way. Her parents visit on Wednesday nights right after their bingo game. They bring popcorn and Cheetos and pick up sticks and dolls that are already named. For Thanksgiving, she has her own stuffed duck prepared by a restaurant cook and a movie camera all set up with a film of a fresh running book. All the porpoises scream and the rabbits hop and the beavers chew trees when they need them, but Patty and Mickey and Liza Sue, who says they can't handle their freedom? Oh. That was kind of a sad book. But it's true, we try to put people in boxes, right? Sometimes metaphorical, sometimes literal. And as a teacher, I learned that every child is different and every child has their own ways of experiencing the world so it's really hard for us to put them in boxes because they don't always fit there <laughs> so now we come to the librarians
And librarians are great people and they know a lot and they can help you with your homework, with writing papers, with researching, with finding good books, all kinds of things. So use your librarians. So this is by Carla Morris, illustrated by Brad Smead. <laughs> Who is this picture? I wonder. Okay, here we go. So you can see all of it. Melvin lived in the Livingston Public Library. Well, he didn't really live there. He just spent lots and lots of time there. He wanted to know a little, know a lot about everything. He was curious. And the library is a wonderful place to be if a person is curious. Everything had its place in the library, and Melvin liked it that way. His favorite books were always in their places, lined up on the shelves like soldiers, and his favorite people were always in their places behind the reference desk. When Melvin was barely tall enough to see over the counter, he started going to the library after school every day. He made sure to stop by the reference desk for a chat with the librarians. They were always happy to see him. Hi, Melvin, Marge said. How was school today? Betty asked. How's the weather out there? Asked Leola. Melvin loved the librarians. Whatever he was interested in, they were interested in too. Where can I find some information about snakes? He asked one afternoon. Well, said Marge, how would you like to go to raise a snake all by yourself? Here's a great book, Raising Snakes in Your Bathtub, From Cute Baby Racers to Big Ugly Cobras. Betty chimed in, here, dear, an arts and crafts book, Making Snake Skin Purses, Shoes, and Other Matching Accessories. Hey, snake poems and blessings, added Leola. She found 42 snake websites with just three keystrokes. That's how librarians are. They just can't help it. And that's why Melvin loved them. In the first grade, Melvin and his class went on a field trip to a real field. That afternoon, he ran to the library to show his friends his treasure, a big mason jar filled with all kinds of bugs. Look what I have, he called as he burst through the library doors. Can you help me identify them? Melvin, don't run in the library. Melvin tripped and the jar sailed across the room. All 87 specimens of caterpillars, cooties, and creepy crawlies were loose in the Livingston Public Library. <laughs> Marge, Betty, and Leola quickly organized an emergency rescue squad. The bugs were retrieved, identified, classified, and cataloged within 20 minutes. How do you do that so fast? asked Melvin. That's how we are, explained Leola. When we see chaos, began Betty. We organize and catalog, finished Marge. It's in our nature. She pulled out a field guide to insects and handed it to Melvin. To apologize, Melvin gave the librarians a lovely bouquet of flowers picked from the library's garden. Then he stopped to examine the aquarium next to the circulation desk. Don't put your hand in the fish tank, Marge warned him. But I was wondering, said Melvin, how many kinds of fish are there in the whole world, in all the lakes, in all the rivers, in all the seas? And how much does the whole world with all the dogs and cats and houses and cars and tractors weigh? The librarians were very busy with other patrons, but Leola knew just where to find some answers for Melvin. She sat down at the computer with Melvin and they found the answers together. She couldn't help it. That's how librarians are. In second grade, Melvin was cast as the enormous eggplant in the school play. He practiced his part with the librarians. Now say your line again, said Leola as the, she shelved the new Caldecott Award winners. Project your voice to the back of the auditorium, said Marge with an alarmingly loud and clear voice. But be natural, said Betty. Try to look like you're not acting. She read aloud from Organic Gardening Magazine to help him find his motivation. The audience gave the enormous eggplant a standing ovation. Melvin always attended the library programs. He was always the first person to complete the summer reading program. He loved the after school specials and the reader guys, book club, and movie nights. He came to all the story hours, no matter the hour. But the spend the night in the library party was the best. Betty read the kids a bedtime story. Melvin curled up in his sleeping bag near the encyclopedia, surrounded by thousands of books. 
he felt rich and happy. We had a sleepover at our library last year. It was fun, but Miss Pam stayed up most of the night and I had a hard time sleeping on the floor. <laughs> in the third grade, Melvin started a bas baseball card collection. He would spread the cards out on a table in the library and organize them into teams, players, and rookies. Betty showed him how to store them in an acid-free archival approved boxes and Leola found him a price guide on the internet. They couldn't help it. That's how librarians are. In fourth grade, Melvin entered the complete and unabridged A to Z spelling bee. Marge suggested he read the 100th edition of Words to Know every day after school. Not surprisingly, he won first place. Polycotyledon, P-O-L-Y-C-O-T. In fifth grade, Melvin won both the gold and silver trophies in the Know Every Town, City, State, and Country in the Solar System Geography Contest. Marge, Betty, and Leola were so proud of him, they couldn't help it. That's how librarians are. In the sixth grade, Melvin entered the extraordinary, completely out of your mind science fair. The librarians helped him to find information about all the project that had ever won. Melvin came up with a winner. In seventh grade, he was picked to be, so you want to be on the smartest kid. Marge, Betty, and Leola burst with pride as Melvin answered questions so fast he blew out the circuits on the computer keeping score. Every day after school, year after year, Melvin came to the library. When he was in high school, he even got a part-time job there. Marge, Betty, and Leola cried with pride and happiness at Melvin's graduation. That's our boy, said Marge. We helped him learn, said Betty. All those books, said Leola. After Melvin left for college, he missed the Livingston Library and his librarian friends. He wrote them letters and emails about the books he was reading and the things he was learning. Years later, another boy came to the Livingston Public Library and loved it. Hi, Sterling, Marge said. How was the field trip, Betty asked. Do you need help identifying those bugs, asked Leola. We can identify, organize, and catalog in no time. We can't help it, said Livingston's newest librarian. That's how we are. Melvin, he grew up to be a librarian. Look at that. So, those are our books for today. I hope you enjoyed them. And again, remember to reach out to your libraries and to your librarians. We are here to help you and we love to find information for you. So, don't be afraid to ask. All right, have a great day. I'll see you next week. Bye.